Hare Krishna. Om Gyana Samirandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Tachurum Militam Vena Tasma Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Yupakadamayam Tadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Harijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Visakam Vitam Sha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Tishapanu Sate Devi Ranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayavacha Patitanam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namonamaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirisesha Sunyavadi Vasyachade Zatarine Jai Hare Krishna Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai I think we made it to uh, uh, chapter 16 is that, did I get that right? Yeah. Chapter 16, I think we're on, yeah. So, uh, yeah, if anyone would like to start reading, please take it away. Chapter 16, Free to Preach. Here I am now, sitting in New York, the world's greatest city, such a magnificent city, but my heart is always hanking after that Vrindavan. I shall be very happy to, to return to my Vrindavan, that sacred place. But then why are you here? Because it is my duty. I have brought some message for your people because I have been so ordered by my superior, my spiritual master. Whatever you have learned, you should go to the Western countries and you must distribute this knowledge. So in spite of all my difficulties, all my inconveniences, I am here because I am obliged by duty. From a lecture by Srila Prabhupada. Room 307 was never meant for use as a residence or ashram or lecture hall. It was only a small narrow office with furniture or a telephone. Its door held a large pane of frosted glass and kind of common old offices. Above the door was a glass pane transom. Prabhupada placed his blankets on a floor before his metal footlocker, which now became a makeshift desk which he wrote. He slept on the floor. There were no facilities here for cooking or even for bathing. So daily he had to walk to Dr. Mishra's apartment. When he lived in room 501, Dr. Mishra's yoga ashram, Dr. Mishra had financed his needs. But now Prabhupada was on his own and whatever he could raise by selling his books, he would have to use for his daily maintenance and for monthly rent of $72. He noted that for a little powder chili in the West End, Superhead charged 25 cents. Ten times to he would have paid in India. He had no guaranteed income. His expenses increased and his physical comfort has reduced. But at least he, was, he had his own place. Now he was free to preach as he liked. He'd come to America to speak about Krishna, and even from the beginning, he had found the opportunity to do so. Whatever an informal get together in the Agarwal's living room or before a formal gathering at Butler's Lions Club, 
Dr. Norman Brown, Sanskrit Master, Dr. Mr. Yoga Society, or the Tagore Society, but he did not much attach him. He did not attach much importance to lecturing, but the people who gathered would hear him only once. This was the main reason he wanted his own building in New York, so that people could come regularly, chant Hare Krishna, take this item in his company, and hear him speak from Bhagavad Gita and Sriman Bhagavatam. Moving out of the yoga studio into a small office downstairs, gave Prabhupada what he was looking for, his own place. But not even you physically could that place be called a temple. His name was on the door. Anyone seeking him there could find him. But who would come there? By his opulence and beauty, a temple was supposed to attract people to Krishna. But room 307 was just the opposite. It was bare poverty, even a person interested in the spiritual topics would find it uncomfortable to sit on rugless floor of a room shaped like a narrow railroad car. One of the mystery students had donated the real to a recorder and Papa recorded some of his sorcery bhajans, which he sang to his own accompaniment of hand symbols. He also recorded a long philosophical lesson introduction to the Panasad. Even if no one attends, she the probably Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasvati told him, you can, come, you can go on chanting to the four walls, but since he was now free to speak his message in the new situation God had provided, he decided to lecture three evenings a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, to whoever would come. His first audiences consisted mainly of people who had heard about him or met him at Dr. Mr. Yuga's studio. And despite the poverty of his room, the means became a source of new life for him. Much he expressed his optimism in a letter to Sumati Mara. I was very much encouraged when you wrote to say, I feel like you should stay there until you fully recover from your, your illness and return only after you have completed your mission. I think these lines dedicated by you are the words of Lord Balakrishna express, express through your goodness. You will be pleased to know that I improved my health back to normal and my missionary work is nicely progressing. I hope my project to start a temple of Sri Radha and Krishna will be realized by the grace of the Lord. Since I came to New York from Butler, Pennsylvania, I have rented the above room at $72 per month. I'm doing lectures on Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, accompanied by Sanskrit and American ladies and gentlemen. Come to hear me. We will be a Surprise to know that they don't understand the language of Sanskrit, yet they hear with attention. The movement which has started here is completely new to them because the Americans are generally acquainted with uh, Indian yoga gymnastics performed by some Indian yogis here. They have never heard of the practical or, or the practical of the science of Krishna before, and still they are hearing me. This is a great success for me. Outside the closed windows of room 307, the late winter night has fallen. Prabhupada's words are punctuated with the muted sounds of car horns and occasionally sirens from the street, and sometimes by the startling chords of a lonely foghorn on the Hudson. Although there the room is warm, Prabhupada is speaking on the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Now Arjuna is perplexed. He is perplexed about whether to fight or not to fight. After seeing in front of him his relatives with whom he was to fight, he was perplexed. And there was some argument with Krishna. Now here is a point. Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Prabhupada's voice is earnest, persuading sometimes his speech becomes high-pitched and breaks with urgency. His cultured British diction bears a heavy Bengali accent. Suddenly he pauses in his lecture and addresses someone in the room. Prabhupada, what is that? Man, what? Prabhupada, what is this book? Man, well, this is a translation of the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada is obviously displeased that while he is speaking, someone is looking for a book. This is hardly like the respect offered to learned speakers described in the Sriman Bhagavatam. Prabhupada, well, no, you can hear me. Man, I am hearing. Prabhupada, yes, don't turn your attention, just hear me. He is taking the teacher teach directing his students. Of course, there is no compelling reason why any of his casual guests should feel obliged to obey him. 
He simply begs for their attention and demands it. Just hear me as he attempts to convince them of Krishna consciousness. You have heard that one must accept the spiritual master after careful examination. Just as one selects a bride or a bridegroom after careful examination. In India, they are very careful because the marriage of boys and girls takes place under the guidance of the parents. So parents very carefully see to it. Similarly, one has to set the spiritual master. It is necessary. Contemplating conjunctions, everyone should have a spiritual master. Perhaps you have seen a sacred thread. We have got sacred thread. Mr. Cohen, have you seen sacred thread? Prabhupada pauses. His audience has not noted the thin white cords he wears beneath his shirt across the upper part of his body. For thousands of years, Brahmins in India have worn such threads placed diagonally across the torso, looped over the left shoulder and down to the right waist. A Brahmana holds his thread in his right hand while chanting the sacred Gayatri mantra three times a day. But this is all strange indeed to Americans. Prabhupada himself is exotic to him. His great chatter wrapped around his shoulders. He sits cross-legged and erect on a thin pillow, and they sit facing him on the other side of his trunk, which now serves as a, as a desk and a lectern. They are close together in the narrowness of the room. He is frail and small and foreign to them, yet somehow he's completely assured in a way that has nothing to do with being a foreigner in New York. Visitors sense his strong presence, two white lines of clay run neatly vertical on his forehead. His pale peach clothes are gathered in loose folds around his body. He pauses only a few seconds to inquire whether they have seen a sacred thread. Uh, shall I read, Prabhu? That sacred thread is a sign that a person has a spiritual master. Here, of course, there is no such distinction. But according to the Hindu system, a married girl also has some signs so that people can understand that this girl is married. She wears a red mark so that others may know that she is married. And according to the division in the hair, what is this line called? Man, part. Prabhupada, mm, man part. Prabhupada, what is the spelling? Man part. Part. This parting also has some meaning. They know English and he knows the Gita, but he knows a good deal of English, whereas they know practically nothing of the Gita, which he has to spoon feed them. But occasionally he asks. Uh, I'm lost. but occasionally he asks their help in English vocabulary when the part is in the middle the girl has her husband and she's coming from a respectable family and if the part is here then she's then she's a prostitute with a slight gesture he raises his hand toward but never really reaching his head yet somehow the half gesture clearly indicates a part on the side of the head and then again, when a girl is well-dressed, it should be understood that she has her husband at home. And when she's not well-dressed, it is to be understood that her husband is away from home. You see, and a widow's dress, there are so many symptoms. So similarly, the sacred thread is a sign that a person has accepted a spiritual master, just as the red mark symbolizes that a girl has a husband. Although his audience may be momentarily enamored by what appears to be a description of an Indian social customs, a careful listener can grasp the great concept of Prabhupada's speech. Everyone must accept a spiritual master. It's a heavy topic for a casual audience. What is the need of taking a spiritual master? Isn't this just for India? But he says everyone should have a spiritual master. What is a spiritual master anyway? Maybe he means that accepting a spiritual master is just another cultural item from Hinduism, like the thread, or the part in a woman's hair, or the widow's dress. The audience can easily regard his discussion as a kind of cultural exposition, just as one comfortably watches a film without the living habits of people in a foreign land, although one has no intention of adopting these habits as one's own. The Swami is wearing one of those threads on his body, but that's for Hindus, and it doesn't mean that Americans should wear them. 
but these Hindu beliefs are interesting. Actually, Prabhupada has no motive but to present the absolute truth as he had heard it in discipline. Disciplic succession. Sorry, Prabhu, can you move it up, please? I can't see. But if anyone, if anyone in that railroad car shaped room were to ask himself, should I have surrendered to a spiritual master, he would be confronted by the exist existential presence of, of a genuine guru. One is free to regard his talk as one likes. In every step, of one's life, the spiritual master guides. Now, to give such guidance, a spiritual master should also be a very perfect man. Otherwise, how can he guide? Now, here Arjuna knows that Sri Krishna is the perfect person, so therefore he is accepting accepting him. Shishyaste aham sadi mam tvam papanam. Sanskrit, no one knows a word of it. But there is never any question for Srila Prabhupada. Even if they don't understand it, the transcendental sound of Shastra would purify them. In this, it is his authority and he cannot omit it. And even, yet, even, and even at first impression, it presents an air of scholarly authority. The original, though foreign words of the sages. I am surrendering unto you and you accept me as your disciple, Arjuna says. Friendly talks cannot make a solution to perplexity. Friendly talks may be going on for years together, but no solution. So here, Arjuna accepts Krishna as the spiritual master. This means that whatever Krishna will dictate, he has to accept. One cannot deny the order of a spiritual master. Therefore, one has to select a spiritual master by whose orders one will not commit a mistake. Hare Krishna. Suppose you accept the wrong person as spiritual master and he guides you wrongly, then your whole life is spoiled. So one has to accept a spiritual master whose guidance will make one's life perfect. That is the relationship between spiritual master and disciple. It is not a formality, it is a great responsibility, both for the disciple and for the spiritual master. And yes, Student, but if the disciple is in ignorance before Prabhupada, yes, Prabhupada acknowledges a serious question. It is for answering questions like this from disciples in ignorance that he has left retirement in India and come to America. Student, how does he know which master to choose? Because he doesn't have the knowledge to make a wise decision. Prabhupada. Yes, so the first thing is that one should be searching after a spiritual master, just as you search after some school. You must at least have some preliminary knowledge of what a school is. You can't search for a school and go to a cloth shop. If you are so ignorant that you do not know what is a school and what is a cloth shop, then it is very difficult for you. You must know at least what a school is, so that knowledge is like this. Tad Vijnan Nasam Saguru Eva Bigachet Samit Pani Shrotiam Brahma Nishtam. According to this verse, the spiritual master is required for a person who is inquisitive about transcendental knowledge. There's another verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam Tasmad Guru Papajeta. Jijnasu Shreya Uttamam. One should search after a spiritual master if one is inquisitive about transcendental subject matters. Unless one is at least conversant with preliminary knowledge of transcendental matters, how can he inquire from the spiritual master? His questioner seems satisfied. The lecture is not a prepared speech on the specific subject, though grave and thorough in scholarship. It ranges over several philosophical points, yet he never pauses, is groping for words. He knows exactly what he wants to say, and it's only a question of how much his audience can take. But sometimes his mood is light, and he commiserates with his fellow New Yorkers, chuckling about the difficulties they share. Suppose there is a heavy snowfall, the whole New York is flooded with snow, and you are all put into inconvenience. That is a sort of suffering, but you have no control over it. 
Sometimes he, he praises Dr. Mishra's students for having learned so nicely from their teacher. Now, what Dr. Mishra is teaching is very nice. He's teaching that first of all, you must know who am I? That is very good, but that who am I can be known from Bhagavad Gita. Also, I'm not this body. And sometimes a guest suddenly speaks out with an irrelevant question and the Swami patiently tries to consider it. Yet behind his tolerance, Prabhupada's mood is always one of urgency. Sometimes he talks quickly and one senses his desire to establish Christian consciousness in the West as soon as possible. He has no followers, only a few books, no temples, and he openly states that he is racing against time. I'm an, old, I'm an old man, I could leave at any time. So behind the former delivery of Krishna consciousness philosophy is an anxiety and an almost desperate desire to convince at least one soul to take up Krishna consciousness immediately. Does anyone else want to read? Uh, now, now the constrained situations of Butler and the Ananda Ashram and Dr. Mishra are behind him. He is free to speak about the absolute truth in full. Throughout his life, he has prepared for this, yet he is still discovering the best ways to present Krishna, exploring his Western audience, testing their reactions. We should always remember that he is God. He is all powerful. In strength, no one could conquer him. In beauty, as far as beauty is concerned, when he was on the battlefield. Have any of you seen a picture of Krishna? Have you seen? Have any of you ever seen Krishna? Oh, uh, no? Prabhupada's voice fades as he pauses, looking out of his audience. No one has ever seen Krishna. None of them have the slightest previous knowledge of Lord Krishna. In India, hundreds of millions worship Lord Krishna daily as the eternal form of all beauty and truth and view his graceful form in sculpture, painting and dance. His philosophical teachings in Bhagavad Gita are all famous and Prabhupada in his intimate and Prabhupada is his intimate emissary. Yet the ladies and gentlemen in room 307 look back at the Swami blankly. Prabhupada is discussing the real meaning of going to a sacred place in India. One should go to a sacred place in order to find some intelligent scholar in spiritual knowledge living there and make association with him, just like I. My residence is at Vrindavan. So at Vrindavan, there are many big scholars and saintly persons living. So one should go to such holy places, not simply to take a bath in water. One must be intelligent enough to find some spiritually advanced man living there and take instruction from him and be benefited by that. If a man has attachment to going to a place of pilgrimage to take a bath, but there's no attraction for hearing from learned people there, he is considered to be an ass. He laughs. Sa eva go kara. Go means cow, and kara means ass. So the whole civilization is moving like a civilization of cows and asses. Everyone is identifying with the body. Yes, do you want to speak? Woman, in the places known as secret places. Prabhupada, sacred, yes. Woman, is it sacred places? Prabhupada, yes. Woman, isn't it also a fact that there is more magnetism because of the meeting of saints and more advanced people? Prabhupada, oh yes, certainly, certainly. Therefore, the place itself has got some magnetism. Woman, yes, and when? Prabhupada, just like at Vrindavan, that is practical. Here I am now sitting in New York, the world's greatest city, such a magnificent city, but my heart is always hankering after that Vrindavan. Woman, yes, laughs. Prabhupada, yes, I'm not happy here. Woman, yes, I know. Prabhupada, I shall be very happy to return to my Vrindavan, that sacred place. But then, why are you here? Now, because it is my duty, I have brought some message for your people. Because I have been ordered by my superior, my spiritual master. Whatever you have learned, you should go to the Western countries and you must distribute this knowledge. So in spite of all my difficulties, all my inconveniences, I am here. Because I am obliged by, obligated by duty. If I go and sit down in Vrindavan, that will be good for my personal conveniences. I should be very comfortable there. And I will have no anxiety, nothing of the sort. But I've taken all the risk in this old age because I am duty bound. I am duty bound. So I have to execute my duty despite all my inconveniences. 
An outsider opens the door and hesitantly glances inside. Rafapad stopping stopping his lecture. Yes, yes, come in. You can come here. Okay, we'll end, end there, if that's okay. Robert Nelson was like a slow, simple country boy with a homespun manner, even though he had grown up in New York City. He was 20 years old. He wasn't part of the growing hippie movement. He didn't take marijuana or other drugs, and he didn't socialize much. He was a loner. He had gotten some technical education at Staten Island Community College, and he tried his hand at the record manufacturing business, but without much success. He was interested in God and would attend various spiritual meetings around the city. So one night he wandered into the yoga society to hear Dr. Mishra's lecture. And there he saw Prabhupada for the first time, Robert. Swami was sitting cross-legged on a bench. There was a meeting and Dr. Mishra was standing up before a group of people. There were about 50 people come there, coming there and he talked on I am consciousness. Dr. Mishra talked and then gave Swami a grand introduction with a big smile. Swamiji is here, he said, and he swings around and waves his hand for a big introduction. It was beautiful. This was after Dr. Mishra spoke for about an hour. Swami didn't speak. He sang a song. Afterward, I went up to him. He had a big smile and he said that he likes young people to take to Krishna consciousness. He was very serious about it. He wanted all young people. So I thought that was very nice. It made sense. So I wanted to help. We stood there talking for about an hour. Mishra had a library in the back. and We looked at certain books, Arjuna, Krishna, chariots and things. And then we walked around. We looked at some of the pictures of Swamis on the wall. By that time it was getting very late and Prabhupada said come back the next day at 10 to his office downstairs. The next day when Robert Nelson went to room 307 Prabhupada invited him in. The room was clearly not intended to serve as a living quarters. There was no toilet, shower, chair, bed or telephone. The walls were painted a dark dismal colour. Prabhupada showed Robert the three volume set of Srimad Bhagavatam, which Robert purchased for $16.50. Then Prabhupada handed him a small piece of paper with the Hare Krishna mantra printed on it. Robert, while Swamiji was handing it to me, he had this big smile on his face, like he was handing me the world. We spent the whole day together. At one point he said, we are going to take a sleep. So he lay down there by his little desk. And so I said, I am tired too. So I lay down at the other end of the room and we rested. I just lay on the floor. It was the only place to do it. But he didn't rest that long, an hour and a half, I think. And we spent the rest of the day together. He was talking about Lord Titania and the Lord's pastimes and he showed me a small picture of Lord Chaitanya. Then he started talking about the devotees of Lord Chaitanya, Nityananda and Advaita. He had a picture of the five of them and a picture of his spiritual master. He said some things in Sanskrit and then he translated. It wasn't much of a room though. You'd really be disappointed if you saw it. Robert Nelson couldn't give Prabhupada the kind of assistance he needed. Lord Chaitanya states that a person has at his command four assets, his life, money, intelligence, and words, at least one of which he should give to the service of God. Robert Nelson did not seem able to give his whole life to Krishna consciousness. And as for money, he had very little. His intelligence was also limited. He spoke unimpressively nor did he have a wide range of friends or contacts among whom to speak. But he was affectionate toward the Swami, and out of eight million people in the city, he was practically the only one who showed personal interest in him and offered to help. 
From his experience in the record business, Mr. Robert, as Swamiji called him, developed a scheme to produce a record of Swamiji's singing. People were always putting out albums with almost anything on them, he explained, and they would always make money or at least break even. So it would be almost impossible to lose money. It was a way he thought he could help make the Swami known, and he tried to convince Prabhupada of the idea. And Prabhupada didn't discourage Mr. Robert, who seemed eager to render this service. Robert, me and the Swami went around to this record company on 46th Street. We went there and I started talking, and the man was all business. He was all business and mean. They go together. So we went in there with a tape. And we tried talking to the man. Swami was talking, but the man said he couldn't put the tape out. I think he listened to the tape, but he wouldn't put it out, so we felt discouraged. But he didn't say much about it. Prabhupada had been in business in India, and he wasn't about to think that he could take up business in a foreign country on the advice of a young boy in New York City. Besides, he had come not to do business, but to preach. Robert, however, was enthusiastically offering service. Perhaps he couldn't become a regular perhaps he wouldn't become a regular brahmachari student, but he had a desire to serve Krishna. For Prabhupada to refuse him would be perhaps to turn away an interested Western young person. Prabhupada had come to speak about Krishna, to present the chanting, and if Mr. Robert wanted to help by arranging for an American record album, then that was welcome. Mr. Robert and the Swami made an odd combination. Prabhupada was elderly and dignified, a deep scholar of Bhagavatam and the Sanskrit language, whereas Robert Nelson was artless, even in Western culture, and inept in worldly ways. Together they would walk, the Swami wearing his winter coat with its imitation fur collar, his Indian dhoti and white pointed shoes. Mr. Robert wearing old khaki pants and an old coat. Prabhupada walked with rapid, determined strides, outpacing the lumbering, rambling, heavy set boy who had befriended him. Mr. Robert was supposed to help Prabhupada in making presentations to businessmen and real estate men, yet he himself was hardly a slick fellow. He was innocent. Robert. Once we went over to this big office building on 42nd Street and we went in there. The rent was thousands of dollars for a whole floor. So I was standing there talking to the man, but I didn't understand how all this money would come. The Swami wanted a big place, and I didn't know what to tell the man. Parapad wanted a big place, and a big place meant a big price. He had no money, and Robert Nelson had only his unemployment check. Still, Prabhupada was interested. If he were to find a building, that would be a great step in his mission. And this was also another way of engaging Mr. Robert. Besides, Krishna might do anything, give anything, or work in any way, ordinary or miraculous. So Prabhupada had this had his reasoning, and Mr. Robert had his. Robert, the building was between 6th and Broadway on 42nd Street some place to open Krishna's temple. We went in and up to the second floor and saw the renting agent, and then we left. I think it was 5,000 a month or 10,000 a month. We got to a certain point and the money was too much, and then we left. When he brought up the prices, I figured we had better not. We had to stop. On another occasion, Robert Nelson took Prabhupada by bus to the Hotel Columbia at 70 West 46th Street. The hotel had a suite that Prabhupada looked at for possible use as a temple, but again, it was very expensive and there was no money. Sometimes Robert would make purchases for Prabhupada with the money from his unemployment check. Once he bought orange colored t-shirts, once he went to Woolworths and bought kitchen pots and pans and some picture frames for Prabhupada's pictures of Lord Chaitanya and his spiritual master. Robert. One time I wanted to know how to make chapati cakes. So Swami says, a hundred dollars please for the recipe. A hundred dollars please. So I went and got some money, but I couldn't get a hundred dollars. But he showed me anyway. 
He taught me to cook and would always repeat, wash hands, wash hands, and you should only eat with your right hand. And whoever met the Swami was almost always impressed. They would start smiling back to him, and sometimes they would say funny things to each other that were nice. The Swami's English was very technical, always. I mean, he had a big vocabulary, but sometimes people had a little trouble understanding him, and you had to help sometimes. The paradox at 64 East 7th Street on the Lower East Side was a restaurant dedicated to the philosophy of George's Oswaha and the macrobiotic diet. It was a storefront below street level with small dining tables placed around the candlelit room. The food was inexpensive and well reputed. Tea was served free as much as you like. More than just a restaurant, the Paradox was a center for spiritual and cultural interests, a meeting place reminiscent of the cafes of Greenwich Village or Paris in the 1920s. A person could spend the whole day at the Paradox without buying anything and no one would complain. The crowd at the Paradox was a mystical congregation interested in teachings from the East. When news of the new Swami uptown at Dr. Mishra's reached the Paradox, the word spread quickly. Harvey Cohen and Bill Epstein were friends. Harvey was a freelance artist and Bill worked at the Paradox. After Harvey had been to Prabhupada's place at Dr. Mishra's yoga studio a few times, he came by the Paradox and began to describe all about the new Swami to Bill and other friends. Bill. I was working at the Paradox one night when Harvey came to me and said, I went to visit Mishra and there's a new Swami there and he's really fantastic. Well, I was involved in macrobiotics and Buddhism, so at first I couldn't care less. But Harvey was a winning and warm personality, and he seemed interested in this. He said, why don't you come uptown? I'd like you to see this. So I went to one of the lectures on 72nd Street. I walked in there and I could feel a certain presence in the Swami. He had a certain very concentrated, intense appearance. He looked pale and kind of weak. I guess he had just come here and he had been through a lot of things. He was sitting there chanting on his beads, which he carried in a little bead bag. One of Dr. Mishra's students was talking and he finally got around to introducing the Swami. He said, we are the moons to the Swami's son. He introduced him in that way. The Swami got up and talked. I didn't know what to think about it. At that time, the only steps I had taken in regard to Indian teaching were through Ramakrishna. But this was the first time, to my knowledge, that Bhakti religion had come to America. Bill Epstein, quite in contrast to Robert Nelson, was a dashing romantic person with long wavy hair and a beard. He was good looking and effervescent and took upon himself a role of informing people at the restaurant of the city's spiritual news. Once he became interested in the new Swami, he made the Swami an ongoing topic of conversation at the restaurant. Bill. I went in the back and I asked Richard, the manager, I'm going to take some food to the Swami. You don't mind, do you? He said, no, take anything you want. So I took some brown rice and other stuff and I brought it up there. I went upstairs and I knocked on the door and there was no answer. I knocked again and I saw that the light was on because it had a glass panel. And finally he answered, I was really scared because I had never really accepted any teacher. He said, come in, come in, sit down. We started talking and he said to me, the first thing that people do when they meet is to show each other love. They exchange names, they exchange something to eat. So he gave me a slice of apple and he showed me the tape recorder he had, probably for recording his chants. Then he said, have you ever chanted? I said, no, I haven't chanted before. So he played a chant and then he spoke to me some more. He said, you must come back. I said, well, if I come back, I'll bring you some more food. Harry Chris, does anyone else want to read? James Green, old carpentry union was the 
Dublin to Eastern philosophy. He lived on the same block as the paradox and began hearing about the Swami from Harvey Cohen and Bill Epstein while regularly taking his evening meal at the restaurant. James, it was really Harvey and Bill who got things going. I remember one of them at Swami G was on the press and did not speak. Fisher students seen more into the bodily aspect of you and listened to one of Swamiji's complaints. The room on his 72nd Street was quite small. He was living in a fairly in a room with the door on the one end. Swamiji would set himself up along one side and we were rather closely packed. It may have been no more than eight feet wide. And it was rather dim. He sat on his thin mattress and then we sat on the floor. He wouldn't come. He would just come and he would lecture. There was no direction other than the lecture on the back of Gita. I had read a lot of literature in my own shy way. I was looking for a master. I think I have no aggression in me or getting quality. I was really just a listener. And that seemed right, hearing the Bhagavad Gita, so I kept coming. It was just, seemed as if things would grow from here. More and more people began coming. Then it got crowded and he had to find another place. The new group from the paradox was young and hip, in contrast to the older, more conservative uptown people who had been attending Prabhupada's classes. In those days, it was still unusual to see a person with long hair and a beard. And when such people started coming to the Swamiji's meeting on West Side, some of the older people were alarmed as one of them noted Swami back to the gap. Back to Vedanta began to pick up another kind of people. He picked them up at the Bowery or Somatics and they came with funny hats and grey blankets wrapped around themselves and they startled me. David Allen, a 21 year old seeker who came from the paradox, had just moved to the city, optimistically attracted by what he had read about experimentation with drugs. He saw the old group as a kind of as budgetary group of older women on the west side listening to the Swami lectures. David, we weren't known as hippies then, but it was strange for the people who had originally been attached to him. It was different from them for them to relate to, his, to this new group. I think most of the teachers from India to up to that time had older followers and sometimes wealthy widows would provide a source of income. But Swamiji changed right away to the younger, poorer group of people. The next thing that happened was that Bill Epstein and others began talking about how it would be better for the Swami to come down, down to the Lower East Side. Things were really happening down there and somehow they weren't happening uptown. People downtown really needed him. Downtown was right, and it was right. There was life down there. There was a lot of energy going around. Hi. Hare Krishna. Well, I continue. Um, Thanks, back to Vinod Prabhu. I think that's the end of the chapter, right? Yeah. So we, we were yeah, that's it. That's it, yeah. Yeah, right, thank you. So, yeah, thanks everyone for reading. And uh, I don't know if anybody's got any comments or questions or anything. I was, I was just thinking at the beginning there, we were saying there's not as many of us tonight. And I was, and I said, it, I don't know if everyone was there at that point, but I said, oh, it, it might just be an intimate one, which is kind of like a sort of uh, a term that me and Hemmer always use when like no one comes to a program. <laughs> It's like a jokey sort of term, me and him, oh, it's going to be an intimate one tonight, you know, when it's just like three people there or something. And, uh, but back to Vinod pointed out, very sagely pointed out that with Parapad, it's, it's always intimate, it should always be intimate, because we're there with Parapad, you know. It's, and then I was just thinking, look at what he's doing, you know, he's sitting in a room with like one guy, 
giving him a slice of apple and you know like very intimate it was really nice hearing about him and mr robert <laughs> yeah. oh poor mr robert you sort of feel a bit for him yes. i reckon we all know someone a bit like yeah, him yeah 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 mr robert that was so sweet Barapa's only friend you know oh, no, probably just... probably <laughs> yeah. They just curled up yeah. and took a nap. It was so cute. Yeah. Sorry to move. Yeah. Prabhupada, he was preaching very simply to Robert, I noticed. You know, it was like, you know, this is a picture and, you know, this is Anja Tapman, things like that, you know? Yeah. It's like, you know, it's just like, you know, I, I like that style of preaching. It's just like, you know, show somebody a picture and say, this is Krishna, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, Shama Sundar, the, the Prabhupada disciple, used to teach to George Harris. He was saying, like, you know, San Francisco, and the fur is in the city. It was kind of like the only place where you could take somebody in a room and point to Jagannath and say, that's God, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and people would, people would be like, yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I love that type of preaching. Well, you know, it's, it's just that, you know, Prabhupada did say, you know, you got to be careful with Krishna consciousness. It's so simple, you might miss it, you know. It's, yeah. it's just like, oh. But, I mean, that that was nectar all the way through that reading, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, it was. I mean, we could learn so much just in that three quarters of an hour reading, it was just so amazing, all the different, the importance of the spiritual master and, you know, how Prabhupada preached and, you know, even in those days, Prabhupada was preaching to this one guy, Robert, who was a bit kind of out of it, but Prabhupada was thinking big. He was thinking, this guy can't he do nothing. He was, he was accepting the guy's service, and um, Prabhupada was thinking back. He'd no money, and he was looking at all these places, you know. So I've learned that from Prabhupada. It's like, think big. I mean, what you got to lose, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I was also impressed. I mean, when he said that place was 10 grand a month or something, mm. I was thinking, what? That's like, that's in 1960. Five or whatever it is, then sixty six. Mm. Thinking ten grand a month, I was like, that's, you know, Prabhupada's just walking in, like, <laughs> well, that that was amazing. That, and then I also was like, like, like you were saying back, back to Vinod Prabhu, like he's he's got he's sitting in a room, he doesn't know anyone, he's got no standing really. Some people have heard of Dr. Mishra's place like him, but he's got no real sort of foothold anywhere. But yet he's telling people, yeah, you have to accept the spiritual master. You have to study and find out something about what a spiritual master is and you know there's none of this like bridge preaching you know thing of like you know or anything like that not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that it's just interesting to see what Prabhupada did in that circumstance where he just speaks very honestly and openly with people and uh it almost when he's talking about how he's come from Vrindavan and it's such a simple place like you were saying showing the picture Everything is just so simple and honest and there's no duplicity or anything there. And it's very powerful, isn't it? You know, when someone's heart is, yeah, it's pure. There's no duplicity. It's very- Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, Prabhupada could do, could, could do things we can't do though. He could do things we can't do. It's like, you know, yeah, I mean, some of us can go up to people and say, okay, you know, this is a book about Krishna and, you know, from a temple and do good work and take some money and people will do it, you know. I mean, I like doing this like the street and things, you know, but you know, I've got, I've got like the confidence to pop and other people aren't like. Saying that, like with them, it's just like that's the way I like doing things, you know. And um, even you know, like last I went to the local park. There's a beautiful park near here, and it's, uh, I go there and do a bit of voluntary work sometimes. But 
you know, normally I'm a T-Mac, but I didn't wear a T-Lag and I wasn't preaching to people. I was just kind of doing the work and chatting away to people and things, you know. And and that way, just make friends to people. And in a new course of time, you know, a year's time or so, invited to them, you see. So, I mean, Prabhupada was an elderly monk who lived, you know, in a very spiritual family and he'd lived in Vrindavan, he lived in India all his life. He was very pure, wasn't he? And I mean, he continued to tell people, okay, you know, Krishna's God, it's like, Hare Hare Krishna. And, yeah, people do it, we've all got our individual way of doing things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was just, I was just thinking it was interesting to see what Parapad, you know, it, it was very, very straightforward for a group of people that have never, didn't even know who'd never heard of Krishna. He asked them, have you, do you, have you seen Krishna or heard of him? And everyone said no. And yet he was sort of still being quite, quite bold. But of course, yeah, time, place and circumstance. Yeah. I saw yeah. that Arvind unmuted before, oh. so I don't know if um, he had to mute just that. To no, share. I was just going to ask, do we know if this Robert got initiated or he became a disciple? Or, or just... I, I don't know. There's a couple of names that I recognise, like, you know, like English names, so to speak. And uh, I didn't mention... There's a couple of names that have come up that I recognise as people that became disciples of Parapad. He's not one of them. I don't recognise his name. Uh, but I didn't mention them because I thought Satsarup Maharaj obviously didn't mention it for a reason. Because they're going to be going to be revealed. I guess it's part of the story who, you know, like that. I didn't want to spoil it and uh, like that. But I, I don't know about anybody else, but I don't recognise his name. No. No. Yeah, I was thinking the same myself. I was wondering, uh, did he initiate it? But I don't know uh, of any Robert um, or this, any story like that where he got initiated. So I don't know if he, if he got initiated. But I was thinking the same myself. I was wondering if I got initiated. Yeah, there were a few people. Um, anyway, I don't want to say too much. I don't, I don't want to spoil. Yeah any bits that might come up. But there was there there were some, there were a few people who come in. Mm. I mean, it, it might not even be mentioned here. I might have read it in other yeah, biographies yeah. of Parapad. But there are people who Parapad met and they did service for him and like took part in everything and were actually quite significant parts of the story. And then they just sort of disappeared and went and did their own, you know, they kind of went their separate we'll ways. We'll see what happens with Robert. Yeah, in we'll the find next out. Week or so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we'll see what happens. But um, but yeah, yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure about that. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if anybody else had any comments or anything, or questions or, or anything they wanted. Mahamantra Prabhu. Mahamantra Prabhu, okay. Hi, Bob. Hi, Just, just a very quick comment. Um, just uh, in the part I was reading, uh, I was very touched when I was reading about um, Brahma talking to the woman and, and saying that he was. I'm happy to be be there you know, after it could be sitting in Vrindavan and have a perfect life, no inconveniences, but he's come here to give Krishna and you know, quite quite dis you know, not not distressing exactly, but like to hear him saying he was like unhappy. Was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was a funny I like, not funny, but I mean like a it, that stuck out to me actually, Prabhu, and I forgot yeah. about it. Yeah, it was not his usual positive, like kind of Yeah. And I thought it was quite touching because I, I guess he was sort of on a level with her then. Yeah. He wasn't up on the Vyasa set. That's what and I kind of felt. Sharing his heart. Yeah. Bit, yeah. He said, actually, yeah, I'm the same. I'm like, I'm also not really into this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, that yeah. was a really good bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes, I don't know if it was here we were talking about it. Maybe it was... But we were saying about how, like, in one sense, Parapad never leaves Vrindavan. So that's something devotees say a lot, isn't it? Parapad never left Vrindavan. Which obviously, in, in one sense, is true. But in another sense, like he really... I think he might have been Adi Guru saying, 
the other week here on a Tuesday night. He was saying Parapai left in Darwin. Like, mate, you know, like yeah. Addy was saying, make no mistake. That's a big austerity, isn't it? You know, it's a big thing. He did leave in Darwin. And then he didn't, he didn't. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Hare Krishna Prabhuji, I have a question. They were, uh, Prabhupada, when he was staying in that room, there was no cooking facilities, no bathing facilities. And obviously he only ate prasadam. So where would he prepare his food? Or would he only just live on fruits? And and where would he go and bathe? I think he went to Dr. Mishra's place to, to, and took bath. I'm pretty sure he went to Dr. Mishra's place. He wasn't living there, but he walked to Dr. Mishra's and he would cook his, I think he, only, he was only taking like one meal a day. And he would cook his one meal and take his bath, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, because it said he was he showed Robert how to cook chapatis. Yeah. So he was I don't know where they did that, but he obviously had cooking yeah, for a hundred dollars. hundred dollars. <laughs> brilliant. You can take the boy out of Calcutta, right? But you can't take the Calcutta out of the boy. That was brilliant. A hundred dollars. That's the businessman in him. Yeah, yeah, it was great. hundred dollars. <laughs> And he didn't have a hundred dollars, but he said, okay, oh, I'll, okay take, I'll, I'll take, I'll take, okay, fine. That Indian thing to do, brilliant. Yeah, so to answer the, I don't know if anybody else knows, but I, as far as I'm aware, I think he was still going back to Dr. Mishra's. So he had to kind of walk a block or whatever, you know, he was doing, and then he could take a bath and come back. Just sleeping in one room, everything in one room. It's quite austere. It's a punishment for a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. As a party, we've got to stop reading, Anna. We could read on and on and on. It'd be like if it's 10 o'clock tonight or something. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like. <laughs> when we get to the end of it and when, when I start uploading it, the te honestly, the temptation to carry on reading it while it's uploading is almost overwhelming. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you just want to sit there and hear, especially when everyone reads together. So I never know. I never know what to do, but I always think it's better to leave it. Hopefully, that's a good idea. Leave it at the end of the chapter. Yeah. Bit of a cliffhanger, and yeah, it's uh, it's, it's real nectar. The problem with um, Krishna consciousness, is at, like once you get stuck into any activity, where do you cap it? It's a big problem. <laughs> it's a constant problem. It really is. <laughs> if that's your worst yeah. problem, yeah, then all right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, but the amazing thing is that at times you don't want to do things, you know, you don't want to like do some Krishna conscious activities, but when you do it, you don't want to stop. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, you know, it's like, we don't know what's good for us, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like, you know, I sometimes think to myself, what's wrong with me? I don't want to enjoy, you know. <laughs> I'm sitting like, uh, enjoy Krishna consciousness, and then the next day it's like, oh, I don't really want to do that, you know, and uh, I'm like, oh, you know, what was wrong with me? I was sitting there enjoying yesterday, you know? I suppose it's just like conditioning of the world, right? It's like, you know, well, speaking for myself, so stupid, you know? It's like, it's like um, you know, forget that... Um, you know, I enjoyed myself and want to do it somewhere else, you know, it's like, one volunteer said that to me in the garden once, but forgotten how to enjoy, you know, mm. and I thought, yeah, we've forgotten how you know, it's like, it's amazing, it? you know, sometimes we don't want to do things, and we do it, and it's like we don't want to stop, anyway, enough for me, um, better than that. Well, Emma and I were talking last night and we were saying, what are we going to do when we get to the end of Leela and Rita? Mm. And I was thinking, maybe we just go back to the start. I think we're about halfway through the first volume or something yeah, yeah. like that. I was thinking we'd go back to the start. And then we had just had this idea that we could just read all the biographies of Karapan. So when we finish Leela and Rita, we're just going to, I think we'll just carry on. Yeah, we can read Mukunda's, Harry Sori, Rancho. Um, yeah. 
There's so many books to so, read. So we've got a long path ahead of us. <laughs> plenty of time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> let you but I, I know that feeling back to the Nova, but I was putting a shed up. Yeah, long story, but I was putting a shed up yesterday for Krishna and it was pouring with rain and the weather was appalling. And it was like, anyway, it was the conditions were horrendous. And I was up a ladder in the dark, nailing the felt onto the roof. And I was just saying to Jake, I was like, I never would have done this as a karmi, you know. I'd have been in the pub by now or smoking a split at the bottom of the, you know, the bottom of the garden. You know, I would have given up a long time ago and just sacked it off. But for somehow for Krishna, you just you just don't stop. You know, you're just in that, it's just enjoyable. Things that used to be horrendous actually now are just incredibly enjoyable. So yeah, thankfully there's no limit. So we, we're all right there. <laughs> Jai. So we'll be back next week for the next. Yeah, chapter. unless anybody wanted to make any quick last. Yeah, last chance. Last to... chance to loom. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, that was the, that's a good idea. I'm going to read all the different uh, books about Prabhupada because then you've got a lifetime of being ahead of you and you can never complain. You have nothing to do with writing. <laughs> or you can never complain about boredom or anything. You know, there's always something to do. Harry Shorey's books amazing, isn't it? The Transcendental Diaries, you know. Totally amazing book. I've met him a few times as well. Really nice to work and Ranshaw as well. Ranshaw's a gentleman, isn't he? It's like, yeah, what a guy. He's, he's a, uh, the Prabhupada disciple, described him as perfect English gentleman. <laughs> I'd say that's right. Yeah. Ranshaw's, yeah, he's a real quintessential Englishman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's an amazing soul. And he writes beautifully, his book, so. And it's just... For all the little bits you hear about in Leela Amrita, there's like a whole book about, you know, mm. like Mukunda Maharaj's book is all about this exact bit we're reading about. It's a whole book about, you know, and mm. so uh, there's so much to go into. So, yeah, we've got a whole yeah. eternal s session of glorifying <laughs> Prabhupada together. It's great. Yeah. Okay. Jai. So, the limitless glories of a pure devotee. Hare Krishna. Thanks, everybody. Hopefully that's all. Everyone's okay and we're happy. And we'll be on Facebook again tomorrow, I think, yeah. if anyone wants to hang out. And, um, yeah. Hare Sorry. Krishna. All glory to Parapad. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, everybody.